Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kim and I'm one of the event hosts here at Pals Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin tonight, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming author events by visiting our website, pals.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Portland activist and photographer Richard Brown in conversation with Brian Benson this Friday, March 5th. If you don't already do so, please consider following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Mark C. Johnson and Steve Dean. Mark C. Johnson has worked as a broadcast journalist and communication and crisis management consultant and served as a top aide to Idaho's longest serving governor, Cecil, Cecil B. Andrus. His biography of New Deal era Montana Senator Burton K. Wheeler was named a Spur Award finalist in 2020 by the Western Writers of America. Johnson's writing on politics and history has been published in the New York Times, California Journal of Politics and Policy, and Montana, the magazine of Western history. And it also appears regularly on the blog of Many, Many Things Considered. While political history has plenty to say about the impact of Ronald Reagan's election to the presidency in 1980, four Senate races that same year have garnered far less attention, despite their similarity, despite their similarly profound political effect. Johnson's new book, Tuesday Night Massacre, looks at those races. In examining the defeat in 1980 of Idaho's Frank Church, South Dakota's George McGovern, John Culver of Iowa, in Birch Bay of Indiana, Johnson tells the story of the beginnings of the divisive partnership, partisanship that has become a constant feature of American politics. The turnover of these seats not only allowed Republicans to gain control of the Senate for the first time since 1954, but also fundamentally altered the conduct of American politics. Joining Johnson in conversation this evening is Steve Dean, Dean is a longtime Metro columnist for the Oregonian and author of eight books, most recently the Mueller Report graphic novel, released by IDW in September of 2000. Dean retired from the Oregonian in 2015, but continues to write two Sunday columns each month. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button <clears throat> at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question as well if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking on the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Mark and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. A link to purchase Tuesday Night Massacre will be shared in the chat this evening. Mark and Steve, it's such a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Kim. You know, Mark, I'm searching your library shelves. I do not see any of my eight books, and it really ticks me off. <laughs> They're right over there, Steve. They're just All right. off camera. Just right All right. Off. Mark, let's begin. 1980, are you serious? What in God's name happened in 1980 that we should still care about? Well, that's a good question. 40 years ago, 41 years ago, uh, I would argue that the 1980 presidential election, Ronald Reagan defeating Jimmy Carter in a landslide, was one of the more consequential elections of the 20th century because it really set in motion a trajectory of the ascendancy really of conservative Republicanism uh, that maybe is still going on, but certainly uh, took off with Reagan's election. What I wanted to look at with this book, Steve, was the consequences beyond Reagan's election, which a lot has been written about, but uh, very little has been written about what happened uh, also on that Tuesday night. 12 Democratic Senate seats flipped to the Republicans, giving Republicans control of the Senate for the first time since 1954. Uh, it fundamentally altered the way we think about Senate races. After 1980, every US Senate race became a national contest more focused on uh, questions of who was going to control the Senate than who would best represent uh, Oregon or Idaho or Mississippi in the United States Senate. So it was a very consequential election. And the other thing that, uh, that happened that sort of provided a hinge point, I think, in our politics 
was the first time widespread use of what we now think of as independent expenditure committees, uh, campaigns that are run independently of the candidates. Um, and those were a relatively new phenomenon in 1980 and certainly had never been rolled out in a coordinated national way as they were in 1980 in these four Senate races that I explore. So, you know, fundamentally, I wanted to answer the question that I think a lot of people have, particularly after 2016, how the heck did we arrive at a, at a Republican party that could embrace uh, a Donald Trump, uh, a game show, a, a former uh, reality television show host who had no political experience, but was uh, ant an antagonist, a, a radical, if you will, uh, on the stump. And I wanted to see if there was any uh, similarities between what we've seen in the last uh, few years and what has happened over the last 40. And I think there are some direct parallels. You know, Mark, you're primarily focused on NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. Right. Can you introduce us to a few of the marquee players with NICPAC? NICPAC had a, a, a short lived existence. It was formed in 1975 by three young uh, activists, conservative activists, with the encouragement of North Carolina's Republican Senator Jesse Helms, known as a real power broker in what was then being referred to as the new right. Uh, these young guys had all been active in the college Republican, young Republican movement, been involved in campaigns at various levels. The uh, guy who became the ultimate uh, sort of face of the organization was a young fellow from New Jersey by the name of Terry Dolan. Uh, and he had two, initially had two co-founders, Charlie Black, who is still around in Washington, DC, a Bigfoot uh, lobbyist, um, a somewhat controversial lobbyist who worked in the Reagan and Bush administrations and a guy whose name uh, is still in the headlines every day almost, Roger Stone. Uh, Stone, Dolan and Black were the founders of this conservative political action committee. Young guys in a hurry, I would say wanted to make a mark on the national political scene and seized upon the ability to use a political action committee to really raise and spend unlimited amounts of money in pretty much whatever way they deemed appropriate. And they really, uh, they raised it by, by, the, by the amounts of the money in politics at the time, they raised a lot of money. Uh, it, it's dwarfed by the way we think about money in politics today. But in 1980, it was a lot of money. And they spread it around these, these four states, targeting specifically these sort of liberal icons in the Senate in 1980. And I think they changed American politics. And they set out to change American politics. And so, Mark, and Ava has already come in with a question, which sort of, and I'm going to combine hers with mine. I mean, what's driving these guys? What is driving the new right? What are the sort of issues and variables that makes, that not only energizes these guys um, in the buildup to the 80 election, but also um, allowed for this unbelievable shift in uh, party structure of the U.S. Senate? Well, they were motivated by a couple of things. They wanted a ideologically pure Republican party. They didn't want uh, any moderate elements, any liberal elements in the party. They set out uh, Dolan was very candid about saying he wanted to purge moderates from the Republican Party. Uh, they wanted to take over the messaging for the party. They wanted to make it a more hard-edged, um, angry, grievance-driven uh, sort of, um, what's the right word? They wanted to act out a motion. Uh, that was their motivator. They realized that fear and emotion are very, very powerful uh, things when applied to a political, in the political context. So they were looking for power for sure. They wanted to be players on the national scene. They wanted to help elect a Republican president, which they did in Ronald Reagan, a guy that they saw as being very compatible with their objectives. Uh, it wasn't very long before they were being critical of Reagan for bringing moderates into his administration. They particularly disliked uh, guys like Howard Baker. They disliked Jim Baker, the guy who became the White House Chief of Staff and you know, still a very uh, well-regarded Republican uh, operative. But they uh, thought those guys were too moderate. They wanted to get them out of the scene. And they wanted to, they wanted to 
you know, cut government down to size, shrink government. Um, Dolan has uh, famously said at one point that he thought government really had only two functions, 99% for national security, 1% for running the post office and leave the rest of it alone. So Mark, in the four races that you focus on, you know, we're talking about the guys who are Birch by uh, George McGovern, John Culver, um, God, who am I forgetting? Frank Church from Idaho. Frank Church. Uh, who were these guys? Um, what did the Senate lose when they were thrown out of office? And what did the Senate gain with the four Republicans who replaced them? Well, you know, I think, Steve, of these four guys that uh, are at the center of the book, the four Democrats, and Culver was the junior member of the group. He was in his first term at, at, as he approached re-election in 1980. Church had been in for four terms, McGovern and Bayh for three terms each. I think of these guys as uh, traditionalists, legislators of the old school, people who went to Washington, D.C. with an agenda that they wanted to work on. Uh, the people who replaced them for the most part had an agenda to say, we're opposed to things. We don't want anything to happen. We want government to shrink. Steve Sims, the, uh, uh, who became a real poster boy of the new right, a congressman in Idaho who defeated Frank Church, his slogan was, I'll take a bite out of government. Uh, and I'm not sure that the record would support the fact that he ever really did take a bite out of government, but that was kind of the attitude. So uh, when you think about Church, Bayh, and McGovern in particular, you know, Frank Church is, was the floor sponsor of the Wilderness Act in 1964, key player on American foreign policy, virtually from the moment he arrived in the Senate, uh, of one of the early opponents of the war in Vietnam, led the investigation of the Central Intelligence Agency in the, in the 70s, arguably, I think, the most important congressional investigation in the history of the country. A uh, presidential candidate in 1976, you know, a guy with a real record of accomplishment. McGovern went to the Senate because he was uh, very, very concerned and throughout his life worked uh, to eliminate poverty and hunger. Uh, Birch Bayh went to the uh, Senate because he wanted to uh, rewrite the Constitution and wound up writing two amendments to the Constitution and creating Title IX, which is so important to uh, women's athletics today, but he saw it as a way to equalize higher educational opportunities for women. So these guys had a real legislative agenda. And the four guys who replaced them, um, Chuck Grassley in Iowa, Dan Quayle in, Illinois, in Indiana, who became eventually became vice president, uh, Jim Abner, a one-term wonder from South Dakota, and Steve Sims from Idaho, who served two terms, among the, uh, among the four of them, you're hard pressed to come up with anything that any of us would recognize as a genuine legislative accomplishment. Not like Birch Bayh writing the Title IX Act or George McGovern creating in a bipartisan way with Bob Dole, the food stamp program. So they were replaced by guys who saw government entirely differently than these incumbent Democrats did. And that fundamentally, I think, has uh, become the way Republican many Republicans in, in Congress operate more as a, as a check on anything happening than having an, an affirmative agenda to create something. So what happens in these four states, Mark, that what are the tactics that Nick Pack and the new right uses um, to win these four elections? Well, one of the things that uh, was really maturing in, 19, in the late 1970s and certainly in this 80 campaign was the sophistication of public opinion polling. And they had very good research. Uh, they employed a guy by the name of Arthur Finkelstein, who was Jesse Helms's pollster. And uh, Finkelstein had a, a, a particularly adept ability uh, to find issues that created emotion around them and anger. Uh, he, somebody said of him that he could look at the results of a public opinion survey and see emotion in it. So they set out very early on with a discrete set of issues uh, to try to uh, pull down the favorability ratings of these incumbent Democrats. And one of the benefits of being able to go back 40 years and look into the archives 
is you can see the polling information that the candidates had at that time. You can see the uh, strategy memos that their advisors came up with. And you could see over the course of 1979, when these attacks began very early in the election cycle, even before the election cycle, really, uh, that the uh, favorability ratings of these incumbents were steadily headed downward. And that was, uh, that was Dolan's doing. He really understood that he had to start early to redefine these guys in the eyes of their constituents. He said famously about Frank Church, he said, after we get done with Frank Church, people will be voting against him and they won't even remember why they're voting against him. So the whole purpose was to attack their character, attack their patriotism, claim that they were um, you know, threats to national security and the nation's interests, and then erode their uh, popularity so that uh, when the campaigns really began in earnest in the uh, summer of 1980, Republican challengers would be in within striking distance of, uh, of a campaign. You know, Nick Pack launched a particularly vicious campaign um, ad or two, you note, know, against John Culver uh, regarding his friendship with Ted Kennedy. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, Culver's a fascinating guy. He, he just passed away uh, a, a few months back. Um, he had been in, in the House uh, of Representatives from Iowa had served before uh, going to Congress as a top aide to Ted Kennedy. They got acquainted when they were in school together at Harvard and played football on the Harvard football team together. Culver was a good enough football player that some people thought maybe he had an opportunity to have an NFL career. Uh, but they were very close, good, good friends from their college days and remained good friends when Culver went to the Senate to, uh, to join Kennedy there. Uh, some of the viewers tonight will remember Kennedy's uh, involvement in what is uh, always referred to as Chappaquiddick, a uh, car accident where he's driving late at night with a young staff member, a young woman in the car. Car goes off a bridge on Martha's Vineyard uh, and she, he escapes from the car. She drowns in the accident. Big, big national story for weeks on end. Um, the attack launched against Culver was that he had gone to uh, see Kennedy in the context of this awful accident to basically say to an old friend, you know, uh, what can I do to be helpful? And that was, that was construed as being, you know, Culver helping Kennedy connive a cover story for what had happened to this young woman, Mary Jo Kopechny. And that uh, smear campaign uh, was rolled out in Iowa against him that he was part of the cover up, if you will, of this accident at Chappaquiddick. So it's, you know, really, um, it, you know, maybe in the context of what we've seen in the last four years, this seems like mild stuff, but in 1980, it was pretty cutting edge uh, negativity. And the same kind of thing was done in, in one degree or another against all of these incumbent Democrats. You know, Mark, you note in the book that Nick Pack aimed its attack ads and direct mail at low information voters. Is that a polite way of saying they're, we're dealing with a bunch of idiots here who aren't really paying attention and are easily manipulated um, as a result? I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the term idiot. I would say they were not involved in politics. Uh, one of the things that Finkelstein's research uncovered was that he could, he could find people who were uh, rarely involved in politics. And you can ask questions to see whether people have voted in the last election. When was the last time you vote? So he was able uh, to narrow his universe down to uh, this group that, was, that could be easily, fairly easily persuaded with an emotional message built around anger or grievance. So yeah, they were targeting folks that were not regular participants in the political process, maybe not regular readers of newspapers or watching watchers of uh, television news. This was before cable TV. So you depended on Walter Cronkite or Huntley and Brinkley for your nightly news if you were paying attention. Uh, and lots of people uh, obviously weren't paying great attention to politics and uh, they targeted that, that segment of the population. And Mark, I, I, the, the four states you're dealing with, um, you know, South Dakota, Iowa, um, 
God, why am I spacing here? Indiana. I mean, you're talking, they're not, they're not, we're not talking about major media markets. No, um, that, and, and that was why another thing uh, Dolan was very good at, he picked these, uh, he picked these targets very carefully. He wanted to go after uh, Democrats in mo mostly conservative states. Uh, Church had been elected, you know, four times in between 1956 and 1980. But Idaho is still a very conservative state, more conservative now than it was then. Uh, South Dakota, the same. Indiana, the same. Iowa, the same. Not big, not dominated by one, uh, big media markets. So their money went farther here. Uh, they had an opportunity to shape the message. And one of the things that they realized very early on was that by creating a narrative in the media, in the press, on television, in newspaper ads, they could drive the coverage of the campaign. And they did that uh, really quite successfully. They Mark, became a part of the. They became a part of the daily dialogue uh, in these campaigns. You know, we're well into. You know, we're eight years past Watergate at this point. Um, you would think there'd be some crusading journalists around who would call BS on these ads and this approach. Where was the press in all of this? Well. Uh, it, I think it was a bit of a press failure in a lot of ways, Steve. Um, reporters in those days, and maybe to some degree still do, cover politics as a kind of a he said, she said, she said, she said uh, kind of thing situation, where you know one candidate says one thing, the other candidate responds, and that's the story, uh, and not go much deeper than that. So most of the reporters that were covering these races on a local basis in those four states really did not, I would argue, see the big picture ramifications of a national organization coming into a state, spending a fair amount of money, and really roiling up the pop population and the politics. So it was a little bit of a failure. The one news organization that I think did an exemplary job of covering this was the Idaho Statesman in Boise. Uh, they assigned a reporter full time to work on these stories. Uh, one of the few really good interviews that was done with uh, Terry Dolan during this period uh, was done by a reporter by the name of Rod Grammer. Uh, and so they, they spent some real time trying to understand the national implications of this. But for the most part, it was covered just like, as I said, one candidate says one thing, somebody else says another, or this independent group is lobbying uh, hand grenades at uh, the incumbents. Mark, one of our listeners has asked about the relationship between Nick Pack and the current CPAC organization, which, of course, the, the right. former president was regaling over the weekend. Um, what is the connection, if any, here? Not any real connection other than uh, CPAC is still affiliated, I believe, with the American Conservative Union which was one of these groups that sort of in an umbrella uh, way came together in the late 70s uh, to redefine republicanism in a lot of ways. I think of Nick Pack as being sort of the, the tip of the spear of those groups, which included the American Conservative Union, Phyllis Schlafly's uh, Eagle Forum, the Moral Majority, which was really coming into its own in this period, the Heritage, Found, uh, Society, Heritage Foundation, all of those groups kind of uh, working in concert and all of them involved in one way or another in each of these races. Uh, and Nick Pack was kind of calling the signals, sort of the quarterback, if you will, of this very, uh, oftentimes very coordinated effort. And I'll get back to that coordination in a second, um, Mark, but um, you quote Richard Vigory, actually Rich, Richard Vigory told uh, Terry Gross, I guess in 2004, it's just the fact of life that people are motivated by anger and fear much more than by positive emotions. And that's not all bad. Sometimes it's very good to have anger. There's a lot to be angry about. You know, what you're arguing, I mean, what were we angry about? What, what issues were, you know, firing people up? I mean, I think you're pointing out, for God's sakes, the Panama Canal was one of the issues that they used as leverage here. I do not understand why anyone was concerned about the Panama Canal in 1980. Well, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to get your head around 40 years later, but it was a huge issue. Panama Canal treaties came to the Senate in 1978. Frank Church from Idaho, again, was the floor sponsor. He managed the debate on the Senate floor. 
telling his wife at one point that he thought this probably could cost him his reelection. It was that emotional. Um, the, the, I guess the brilliance of a guy like Richard Vigory, who is still around, sometimes referred to as the funding father of the new right, or the direct mail guru, uh, was that he could deliver these messages uh, at the same time he was raising money around the messages. So he could rile up uh, these you know, minimal uh, information voters, low information voters, with a very simple message. You know, Frank Church, George McGovern, these guys are giving away your Panama Canal. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, very much made that an issue in his 1976 challenge to Gerald Ford, which he lost that uh, Republican nomination to Ford, but it remained a powerful issue on the right. And Vigory said after the treaties passed the Senate in 1978 with bipartisan support uh, and quite overwhelmingly passed, he said, we lost the issue, but we, we lost the battle, but we lost the treaties, but we have the issue. It'll, it'll remain a, a potent issue. And it did. And uh, it was a very simple thing uh, to create, uh, you know, anger and animosity around why did the United States give away the Panama Canal? Why are we giving a 10 horn dictator in Panama control over this canal that we spent millions and millions of dollars 75 years ago to build? Well, of course, uh, some would say we stole the canal fair and square uh, in the days of Theodore Roosevelt. And one of the concerns at the time, one of the concerns during the debate over the Panama Canal treaties was that uh, literally tens of thousands of US service personnel were tied up in Panama protecting the canal, not so much from any foreign threat, but from uh, concern about uh, an uprising in Panama over uh, the, in, in Church's view, the very legitimate reasons that Panamanians maybe would like to have sovereignty over this six mile wide stretch of canal zone that ran from one side of their country to the other. And he saw it very much as the United States sending a signal to the rest of the world and particularly to Latin America that the US could be a trusted partner. It wasn't gonna be the big bully on the block. And the irony is of course, uh, the Panama Canal has operated very well uh, in the 40 intervening years, never fell into communist uh, hands as Ronald Reagan predicted it would. And uh, the Panamanians have actually spent millions and millions of dollars upgrading the canal since they've uh, had control of it. You know, Mark, with all due respect, I think half of our audience is right now on the phone to Uber Eats because they're so sick and tired of Panama. And I don't get it. I still don't. The, the <laughs> idea that that was a wedge issue to me is extraordinary. Um, well, how let much me just give you one quick, uh, I won't prolong the Panama discussion, but one example in Frank Church's race the closing campaign ad from Nick Pack was their state director looking into the camera and saying, this election comes down to one simple issue. Frank Church gave away the Panama Canal. End of story. How much of Terry Dolan's vision was realized by the Tea Party? And how much did it require the bizarre ascendancy and metamorphosis of Donald Trump? Oh, I think, uh, I think it, that's the arc that I try to draw in the book, Steve, that there really is a connection between the kind of politics that these guys embraced in the late 1970s and carried on through, frankly, Newt Gingrich takeover of the Republican Congress in 1994. Gingrich was an early acolyte of Nick Pack he participated in some of their campaign trainings. He received financial support from Nick Pack very early on in his career. I think he adopted Terry Dolan's sort of approach to political language. And then, you know, consequently, you've, you've got uh, a further radicalization of the party, I think, in the form of uh, the uh, host of The Apprentice uh, taking over the party, taking it away from the establishment figures in the party and playing upon, again, whatever you think of Donald Trump, he's a master of playing on people's fears, the sense of grievance, the sense that the country's changing in a way that is uncomfortable to people and that you can make political hay around that. And that's very much what Terry Dolan was doing in 1980. You know, Tobias Reed has weighed in with, I think, a, 
the question that everyone um, is wrestling with at the moment, do you think it more likely that the establishment of the grand old party reasserts itself eventually, or that the descendants of Nick Pack in the form of the Trump wing of the party has permanently taken over uh, the Republicans? Well, uh, I think the jury is out on that. It's probably too early to tell, but it certainly would seem that Trump remains firmly in control of the Republican party. He's the biggest actor on the Republican stage. Uh, the fact that uh, the Senate now minority leader uh, Mitch McConnell could vote to acquit him in the recent impeachment trial and then take to the floor of the center, Senate and issue an absolutely excoriating message about how responsible uh, Donald Trump was for the insurrection in the Capitol on January 6th, and then go on Fox television 10 days later and say, well, sure, I could support him in 2014 if he runs again. Does that uh, portend much for a more uh, responsible element of the Republican Party reasserting itself. I guess I'm uh, I'm from Missouri on that. You're going to have to show me that there's uh, a possibility that that might happen. I don't see much evidence of it, and frankly, it's seeped down to the local level now in so many ways, as you well know, Steve. I mean, here again, you've got uh, Oregon State uh, Republican state senators walking out of the Capitol building this past week. Uh, shutting down the legislature, uh, that kind of thing. You've got, uh, you know, Democrats are not the ones that are talking about shutting down the government every uh, few months when they don't get their way on something. So that kind of radicalization is deeply baked into the Republican DNA right now, it seems to me. And it's going to take a Herculean effort on the part of some of these more responsible vo conservative voices uh, to try to wrench the party back in some more constructive way. But uh, who, who, will, who will that be? Will it be a Ben Sass from Nebraska? Will it be this young uh, congressman from Wisconsin, Kensinger, uh, or somebody else, uh, Mitt Romney? I don't know. Uh, I don't see much evidence that they're getting much traction, at least yet. You know, what I, I'm, I don't want to get focused on Trump at all. Um, we focused on Trump much too much in the last you know, five years. But some you could argue that he operates in a vacuum, a vacuum in which um, the legislative branch of government has no spine, personality, um, mission statement, whatever. Can you talk about how in 1980 or in 1979, there were good things to be said about the US Senate. Um, how has that evolved into what we're dealing with now? Well, uh, again, I think a direct consequence of what we've been talking about 40 years ago, and it, it took some time to get where we are, uh, but we are there. So I think what's happened is uh, moderates for the most part have been purged from both the political parties. Uh, at the time that, you know, Birch Bayh and George McGovern and Frank Church came to the Senate, there were conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans. Those are, uh, if not endangered species, extinct, extinct in species these days. So the moderates have been purged from, uh, from both parties for the most part. The chance that there could be a national consensus develop around an issue like climate change or um, a better, uh, more cost-effective healthcare system in America that covered more people and didn't cost so dang much, uh, finding a middle ground approach to that uh, seems almost inconceivable right now. And that's, uh, that's the tragedy of what's happened, I think, to the United States Senate. Um, I studied, uh, I have been studying a fair amount about the Senate in the 1960s, where you really think of the 60s as a very tumultuous time in American history, Vietnam, campus upheaval, civil rights. Yet the Senate, in a very bipartisan way, did some amazing things in that decade passed the Civil Rights Act, passed the Voting Rights Act, broke the Southern filibuster for the first time really on civil rights, created Medicare, created a whole bunch of uh, social programs related to the New Deal, uh, national parks and public broadcasting and on and on and on. Um, and it was all done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, 
the guy who worked for Mike Mansfield, who was the majority leader that during that whole decade, said he could not remember one significant piece of legislation that passed the Senate in the 60s that didn't pass on a bipartisan basis. So that's what's missing from our politics. And the more we uh, become ideologic, ideologic about our politics, the less opportunity there is uh, for people to find some degree of common ground. And, uh, and that, again, I think is a legacy of this period. You know, it's hard to pass bipartisan legislation, Mark, when you can't apparently even now talk, dine, uh, go out on weekend hunting trips with members right. of the other party. Ben Bowman is sort of bringing this up that, I mean, I assume that, does that seem to have permanently changed that Democrats and Republicans aren't even allowed to get on an elevator together anymore? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you hear this anecdotally and, and in real time all the time about how difficult it is for members of the Senate, and I'm focused on the Senate, uh, how difficult it is for them to build relationships with each other. Uh, they don't socialize together for the most part, and even pre-COVID they didn't socialize, socialize very much. It's rare that you hear about a Democrat and a Republican who have a genuine friendship in the Senate, maybe uh, you know, very partisan in their approach to issues or very different orientation about how to solve the nation's problems, but they don't even have really personal relationships in many cases. Now that's not a universal, that's not a universal condemnation of the Senate, but it certainly is more obvious than it was in the days when uh, these guys like Church and Bai were involved in the Senate. I have an anecdote in the book about Bai that I love. He's a brand new Senator elected in 1962 He's invited on, a, on the presidential yacht on the Potomac, the Sequoia, with John Kennedy, the president. And one of the people on the uh, cruise, the after dinner cruise on the Potomac is Everett Dirksen, the majority leader, Republican leader of the Senate. He goes over and sits down next to Bai and he says, Birch, uh, we're gonna have to start talking about how to get you reelected back here. Now imagine a Republican Senator saying that to a young Democratic newcomer today. It's just inconceivable that that would happen. Uh, so, you know, the, and I, you can be easy to be nostalgic about the, the old days in politics and there's never been a golden age. I don't believe that uh, for a minute, but there were uh, bigger people in many respects in these positions and they had a national agenda and they cared about trying to move things in some constructive direction. And I think of people like, you know, Mark Hatfield from Oregon, uh, Frank Church from Idaho, Howard Baker from Tennessee, Clifford Case from New Jersey, John Sherman Cooper from uh, Kentucky, moderate Republicans working across the aisle with Democrats, McGovern and Dole working on food stamps is one of the great bipartisan success stories of the 1960s. And we, you know, that's missing. And it's, it's, it's a real danger to the system that it's missing. You know, Mark, during the presidential campaign, Joe Biden mentioned that early in his Senate career, he actually had a relationship with James Eastman Eastland from Mississippi. Right. And he got royally criticized for that. Can you provide some context for that for us? Well, uh, yeah, Biden comes to the Senate uh, as, a, as 30, 30 years old in uh, 1972. And Eastland has been in the, in the Senate since 1933 uh, and has risen through the ranks of seniority to chair the Senate Judiciary Committee. He's an unreconstructed racist, no question about it. One of the last most vociferous opponents of uh, segregation, a champion of filibustering the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, a real bigot. There's no two ways about it. But the man is chairman of one of the most important and powerful uh, committees in the United States Senate. So this junior senator from Delaware uh, decides what I think any reasonable person would do. I have to have a relationship with this guy. I have to have an understanding of what he's all about. If I'm going to be on his, a member of his committee, particularly a junior member of his committee, if I ever want to get anything done, I'm going to have to figure out how to work with this guy. So not excusing in any way uh, Eastland's segregationist views and his racism, uh, at the same time, you have to have, understand the political reality of the fact that it, you wanna get something done in the Senate, 
You're going to have to have a relationship with a guy who sets the agenda for your committee. And uh, yeah, you're right. When Biden's running for president, uh, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris both uh, took out after him for mentioning the fact that uh, as much as he ab abhorred uh, Eastland's uh, stance on racial issues, that he had a relationship with him. They, he got along with him. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have a drink together and talk about the day's events. And once in a while, when Biden had something that he wanted to get done, he could rely on Eastland to help him get it done. I have a couple more things. That's called politics, Steve. Yeah, and well, no kidding. Um, and, and politics, by the way, practiced by some legendary Oregonian uh, senators, Mark Hatfield and Bob Packwood. And I speak to that for just a moment, Mark. I mean, it's a small thing, but when the sh balance of power shifts parties in 1980, what does that mean for states on the West Coast? Well, let me just say a word about Hatfield because he's in the book in a couple of different ways. Uh, he early on recognized that the this new right uh, element was going to be a real danger to the Republican Party and change the Republican Party in a way that uh, he was prophesizing as early as the mid 70s was going to be a very dangerous trend. Um, he had a good friendship, uh, Hatfield did, with uh, a Democrat from New Hampshire, Tom McIntyre, who lost in 1978 in a campaign that Nick Pack uh, helped orchestrate against him. And uh, Hatfield wrote the foreword to McIntyre's book about his experience dealing with the new right. And he basically said, this is a real danger to democracy that we're headed down this path of demonizing your opponent, making every battle uh, a grudge battle, a partisan grudge battle. So uh, hats off to Hatfield for, for that among many other things in his long career. But the consequence for Western Republicans after 1980 was a real elevation of the Republican Party's influence in the Senate, particularly. So uh, Hatfield becomes uh, chairman of uh, the Commerce Committee. Um, Packwood becomes uh, chairman of the Finance Committee. Jim McClure in Idaho becomes chairman of the Energy Committee. Ted Stevens in Alaska chairs appropriations. Uh, so all of these Western Republicans who've been you know, sort of uh, laboring for years in the minority suddenly find newfound power uh, in the Senate uh, after 1980. I'm, I'm, of course, the other consequence is guys like uh, Mark Hatfield, you could argue as probably as good an example, almost as good an example as I can come up with of the last really senior moderate uh, in the Republican party in the Senate. Nobody like him today. Again, looking at some of the questions we're getting, one, someone, Charlie Hyman has asked if Carter's early concession speech uh, deserves some blame for the loss of uh, Church Magnuson, Clark Rooning, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good question, Charlie. I think, uh, yeah, at the margins, it might have had some impact. Just to quickly tell the story, uh, Carter realized uh, the weekend before the election that he was going to lose and lose big. Uh, he was told on a trip back from Seattle to Washington, D.C. by uh, Hamilton Jordan, his chief of staff, that he was going to get uh, creamed. So he knew he was going to lose, and he wanted to get the uh, get the agony behind him. So he made perhaps the earliest concession speech in modern political history, uh, conceding before the polls had closed in the Pacific time zone. There's some anecdotal evidence in Idaho and California, for example, that people had come to the polls to vote, you know, before the polls closed at eight o'clock but maybe very late in the day and heard on the radio uh, that Carter had conceded to Reagan and decided not to go in and uh, cast their ballot. So it may have had some impact at the margin. Um, actually in Idaho, I think Steve, uh, Steve Sims won the election in Eastern Idaho, which is not in the Pacific time zone uh, rather than in Northern Idaho, which is, but, but it had some effect and Democrats were really ticked off at Carter for doing this. Uh, Tip O'Neill, in particular, said some unkind words to uh, some of Carter's staffers about it. Mark, Brad Snow has been waiting 10 minutes for an answer to a... Brad Snow is an old, old friend of mine from uh, Livingston, Montana. Well, he's smarter than I am. Um, and by the way, every time you mention Montana, 
I want to talk to, it makes me want to talk to you about just how bad Kevin Costner is in Yellowstone. <laughs> but we'll get back to that. Um, Brad is saying to a significant extent, it seems Trump has turned the Republican party into a personality cult. To what extent was Nick Pack pushing for a conservative ideolo ideology that would have been at odds with Trumpism? Well, that's a great question uh, and the kind of question I expect from Brad. Uh, yeah, I think it has become a personality cult in many, in many respects. Uh, you see this uh, performance at the CPAC conference last weekend where, I mean, they actually rolled in a golden statue of Trump uh, into the lobby of the Hyatt Hotel. I mean, uh, somebody needs to read the Bible. That golden idol thing didn't work out all that well, as I recall my biblical history. Uh, but yeah, I don't think uh, Dolan per se and his acolytes uh, saw a cult of personality growing up around, say, Ronald Reagan. Uh, they really wanted to ride Reagan's uh, coattails in a way because he was enormously popular. Uh, he had a, you know, a winning personality, was a great communicator, all the things we remember about Reagan. Uh, but I don't think they saw the party necessarily turning into a, uh, a cult of personality uh, dominated by somebody with uh, the, the, frankly, the incompetent political skills of Trump. Now, he's not incompetent when it comes to riling people up and making people angry and allowing them to act on that grievance. But he's really, he was really pretty incompetent uh, as a politician. How else do you explain the fact that he lost, helped contribute to the loss of the House, the Senate, and the White House during his four years in, in the White House. So yeah, I don't think uh, they were looking for a cult of personality. They were looking for an ideological Republican Party, no question about that. You know, you, you deal with harbingers in this book. Um, and speaking of which, uh, this caught my eye, after his loss, his loss Birch by wished Quayle and Reagan the best and said he harbored no hard feelings over any of what happened in the campaign except for this. And I'm quoting by, I was appalled by the right-wing hate groups led by churchmen who used claims of knowing God's will to seek political power. Um, Speaking of things that are utterly baffling, Mark, you got 81% of evangelicals who are seeming to be in Trump's corner. What is going on with the church and with what was going on in 1980 and how has that evolved that evangelicals, whatever exactly that means, have become this unbelievably divisive um, force for conservatism, for the Republican Party? Well, it's one of the great stories of the last 40 years, I think. You know, uh, Jimmy Carter runs for president in 1976, a card-carrying Southern Baptist evangelical Sunday school teacher, and evangelicals supported him overwhelmingly. Four years later, they turned on a dime, embraced Ronald Reagan, who nobody would, I don't think even uh, Reagan admirers would say, was uh, much of a regular churchgoer or somebody who... Uh, you know, really perhaps was very comfortable uh, talking about his religious faith. And now uh, the evangelical community to an overwhelming degree has embraced this guy who, uh, you know, didn't hold the Bible right side up when he uh, stood in front of uh, the church in Washington, in downtown Washington, DC. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute, Steve, just a few days ago did a survey of evangelicals. And one of the findings I made a note of this 60% of those they surveyed said they agreed that the traditional way of American life is disappearing so fast, we may have to use force to save it. So evangelicals, 89% um, said the Confederate flag uh, doesn't say anything about racism. It's more about uh, national pride. 83% uh, called police killings of blacks isolated incidents. 68% uh, said COVID deaths were exaggerated. So this is, uh, you know, one of, the chapter, one of the chapters in the book that sort of sums up what I take away from these 1980 elections is entitled, It Was an Act of God. And people were saying that these de the defeat of these Democrats in 1980 
uh, was divinely, uh, divinely inspired, that there was divine intervention that took out a guy like uh, Birch Bayh or a guy like George McGovern. You know, McGovern was, was really angry because there were uh, commercials run against him in South Dakota that said he was anti-family. Well, you know, he had a family, had grandkids. Uh, he was a World War, decorated World War II bomber pilot. This guy is the all-American success story. And he is denigrated as the anti-family candidate running against opponent who was a lifelong bachelor, never had uh, a family. So, uh, you know, you can, I guess you can spin these things in a, in a thousand different ways, but the evangelical, one of the great mysteries to me is the evangelical community embracing as completely as they do Donald Trump. It has something to do with that belief that traditional, that their version of a traditional American way of life is disappearing and it is scaring the bejesus out of them. You know, we're close to wrapping up here, Mark. You know, you conclude at the end of the book, what does seem certain is that a United States Senate perpetually broken by severe partisanship is incapable of self-correction. Uh, Patricia Johnson is asking, you know, you're arguing the Republicans, the conservative Republicans have created the current situation. Is there any way, again, I guess what I'm, I'm looking about, talk, thinking about self-correction, can the primary movers in this disaster correct it or are we looking at starting over for to have any hope um, when it comes to American politics? Well, Steve, I tend to be a, a pessimist and you know, pessimists are rarely wrong, it seems to me. So, uh, but I, I do have one little shred of optimism about the current moment. And that frankly is Joe Biden, who may have not been my personal number one choice to be president of the United States, but it strikes me he might be just about the right kind of individual to have at this time. He, he, he grew up in the Senate. He's an institutionalist in Washington, DC. He understands what has to happen to make politics work. Uh, he has uh, empathy and respect for people. And that's been sorely missing for at least the last four years and probably uh, much, before, much beyond that. So I have a little bit of optimism that maybe this new tone uh, can be self-correcting in a way. Now, somebody on the conservative side of the political spectrum is going to have to be willing to meet at least a little bit in the middle uh, on some of these issues uh, in order to prove to the American people that politics can work again and big national problems can be addressed. Um, but if you're already uh, aiming toward the 2022 midterms, and raising money around the fact that you're opposed to everything that the incumbent Democrat is uh, suggesting, then it doesn't augur much hope for uh, a better political future for the country, I'm afraid. So I, I have a little glimmer of hope there, but uh, fundamentally, I'm kind of pessimistic about the whole thing. I'm gonna take some new faces to come in and say, we got to do things a better way. And Mark, let me end with this then. Um, what is, your next book project. I mean, what's the book by you that we're going to be reading hopefully 12 to 18 months uh, from now that will make us realize how right or how wrong you are? Well, that's, uh, you, I hope to come back and you can uh, ask me that question in, a, in, a, in a 24 months. I'm working on a book uh, on the, the Senate in the 1960s when, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was a real sense of bipartisan accomplishment and I'm, I'm trying to tell the story through the lens of the personal relationship that existed between Senator Mike Mansfield from Montana and Senator Everett Dirksen from Illinois, the two party leaders in the Senate. Very, very different individuals, uh, mostly forgotten to history now, but a, a, a pair of remarkable Americans who uh, found a way to pass a lot of legislation on a bipartisan basis at a time when the country was very divided over Vietnam and civil rights and all kinds of things. So that's what I'm working on. Well, good luck with that. Um... Hey, and thank you very much for doing this, my friend. Uh, it really means a lot to me to have an opportunity to visit with you. Congratulations on the new granddaughter. 
If you haven't read Steve's most recent column in the Oregonian about uh, uh, the satisfaction of becoming a grandfather, I highly recommend it. One of the best things I've read in ages. So congratulations. Thank you, Mark. Great book. Thank you. And Kim, thank you. And thanks to Powell so much for uh, indulging this conversation tonight. I hope you all will uh, buy many books from uh, the great independent bookstore in Portland. Mine and Steve's included. That sounds great. Thank you all for joining us for this evening's event. Um, <clears throat> as Mark mentioned, please consider purchasing a copy of his new book by visiting us at pals.com. And while there, be sure to check out our upcoming lineup of virtual events. We really look forward to seeing you again soon. Mark and Steve, thank you so much. We're very grateful to you for being here this evening. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.